Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Coping Together. Today's session is being facilitated by me. My name is Alan Bruns, and I'm one of the program coordinators for the Mental Health Connections Program at the Mental Health Association of Central Florida. And our guest today is Stephen Schnell. He has worked with the Central Florida Behavioral Hospital for over four years, where he has primarily worked on their specialized unit for acute treatment of thought disorders. And he has previously actually volunteered with our organization as a guardian advocate back in 2012. So with Stephen's work in mind, uh, that brings us to our subject today, which is severe and persistent mental illness. And uh, we'll also be talking about how that relates to the pandemic that's going on right now. So Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a, a very much needed thing to talk about. Definitely. Uh, I mean, I know from my experience speaking with clients firsthand and my involvement in recruiting for the GA program, uh, this population is definitely one that needs to be discussed more. And I know you feel the same way. So I'm very excited yeah. to get this information to people. Awesome. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So trying to just jump into questions uh, to begin with, uh, what is severe or persistent mental illness? And uh, could you tell me a little bit more about your experience working with that population? Of course. So with, with severe and persistent mental illness, a lot of people refer to it as SPMI. Um, and previously they were, that population was identified as those with chronic mental illness, um, which over time kind of, transition into SPMI because of um, the view that with treatment and support, it's not necessarily a chronic condition rather than a, rather a severe and persistent one that has potential to get stabilized if there's enough support. Um, typically, um, it's viewed as the schizophrenia spectrum diagnosis. So schizophrenia, schizoaffective, um, severe bipolar disorder and severe depression um, all can be lumped into that based on who who you're talking to um, and part of and what I had mentioned as far as the transition from S, uh, chronic mental illness to SPMI the one important thing is having that support um, and making sure that we're connecting them with resources, which I know is something that Mental Health Association is very good at. Um, and then um, just in those resources, making sure that they're being taught life skills, being taught um, ways to manage their illness, to keep it viewed as SPMI rather than a chronic condition. Um, and with, as far as with my, my experience with it, um, I have been at Central Florida Behavioral, um, primarily with, um, with the Palms unit, which we consider our thought disorder unit. A lot of the individuals do suffer from SPMI there. Um, I, I really got my, my heart in with this population back when I started as a GA with you guys, um, which was, all the way back in 2012 now. Um, crazy to think how, how fast time has gone. Right. But th they are a population very near and dear to my heart um, as far as often people who have a difficult time advocating for themselves um, because of the, the symptoms that they're experiencing and just the, the difficulties that they face. Um, so in working with them here in a, a relatively short-term setting, um, really trying to empower them, empower the family, the support system to um, help get them set up for success when they transition to a less acute level of care. And uh, this population, you know, already just in normal circumstances faces, you know, difficult things uh, every day, but what are some of the challenges that are affecting them even more so with the environment that, you know, the co coronavirus and the pandemic has created? And so spe speaking for me, and I know a lot of, a lot of other people were having a hard enough time with the curfews and lockdown and the, the fear of the unknown with everything that comes along with something our 
generation has never had to go through before, or many generations haven't had to go through something like this, um, at least to this, this extreme. So really for anyone, let alone someone who does have a, a chronic or severe and persistent um, mental disorder, um, would be even more challenging to go through. Um, I know, um, like I said, for everyone, there's the fear of the unknown, especially um, if we do suffer from a, one of those mental disorders. Um, I know some of the specific barriers that I was reflecting on. Um, so right now, which has let up a little bit, but there was a, a curfew in order. What if, we, what if we do have one of these conditions and we don't have a place to stay? Even more fear of the unknown of what if law enforcement finds me out on the streets and I don't, I don't have a place to stay. I don't wanna be charged with anything. I don't wanna be brought to jail. But then another barrier of um, what if I don't have an ID to get into one of the local shelters? Um, and then I know right now the there was difficulties with the, the DMV it, even getting in there to get an ID to get into one of the shelters. Um, and I think those things are, that'd be a lot for even me to try and navigate that system on my, on my own, let alone um, with that extra barrier added to it as well. Um, the, of course, there's always financial difficulties, which I know we've had some, some individuals who had been stable under treatment for quite a, quite a while, loss of a job, and now are at risk of eviction and are having another episode because if we're, a lot of times if we're predisposed to having a hard time managing a stressful situation, this is probably one of the, the top most difficult ones that anyone can go through. Um, so that's, that's an extra barrier. Um, I know a lot of agencies have been doing their best to support this population, any population in the difficult time. Um, I know a lot of agencies have transitioned into doing telehealth services. Um, one of the barriers we've seen is, well, I don't have a phone or the phone that I have is one of the flip phones that, um, was given to me by my insurance or um, or through some support system in the community. Um, and I don't have access to then go to my telehealth appointment. Um, and overall it's kind of building off of the already known barriers that there are and kind of just amplifying. Yeah, and kind of going off a little bit what you're saying, I, uh, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but it's pretty well known that a large number of this population are homeless or very low income individuals. Uh, and uh, like you mentioned, you know, a lot of them don't have access to that technology that can help them keep in contact with, you know, the psychiatrists or the counselors or whoever in their life. So that is definitely something that they're, they're struggling a lot with. Um, and uh, and as I'm sure you're aware, there has been for for so many years a, a, a very large stigma against this population in general, uh, and you know some seeing them as violent or seeing them as being uh, you know unstable or not able to be around others. Uh, there's been a large stigma in that regard. So why do you think that is? And then what are some things that you would say to someone who has that way of thinking? Absolutely. Um, I think part of the difficulty, um, is it's often something that's not really talked about. Um, even, um, in like the school system getting, getting a, a degree in this, it's, it is definitely addressed, but, um, it's not necessarily as, um, it's not as dived into as some other topics might be. Um, or a lot of times I get the question, how do we work with someone like this? Because there is the, the unknown. It's often not, not really as talked about, um, which reinforces the 
um, the difficulty of, I don't really know what to expect. Um, and like you said, a lot of individuals do see um, how this might be portrayed in, in movies or in television. And in, in real life, it is a lot different. Um, the, like you said, um, there's this a belief that this population is dangerous or unstable or unpredictable or a threat to society. And they're, they're just individuals that, that have an illness that they, they, can't, they can't stop themselves from having this illness. Um, and part of that, that illness is, um, in a way, their mind is playing a trick on them that maybe I don't need the treatment or everything is fine how it is. Um, so it's trying to overcome that, that barrier. Um, I know one of the even more harmful things is, um, and this is for, for any group of people, is labeling them all as the same. Um, and that's definitely one of the detrimental things that can be done for a population that's already so misunderstood. I completely agree. And uh, is there anything that you would say to someone who maybe is thinking that way? And yeah, so I making sure that we're this is something that we're talking about. Um, I I wish everyone could see see this population in the way that I do. That they're just an in, an individual with a heart um, that's no different than you or I and just in the in the in life got dealt a, a different hand than you or I um, or one of our family members or one of their family members um, and um, they're they're just trying to navigate life just like we are um, with an extra uh, barrier um, and just making sure we're talking about it supporting them and really a lot of times I've been asked, well, how do we, how do we work with someone like this or how do we support yeah. someone like this? And really it's no different than how we would work to work with someone else. Um, and it's just meeting them where they're at, um, having that conversation with them of, well, I want to support you. Um, and how can we work together on that? What do you need from us? As, mm -hmm. as healthcare professionals and um, and obviously always also saying what what recommendations might be but at the very basis it's no different than anyone else and just meeting them where they're at mm -hmm. and going a little bit off what, what you're saying uh, a, a lot of family members for example they like you exactly what you said they, they don't know how to help these people or how to how to mm -hmm. interact sometimes with them so I think yeah. that a, a great thing to do well, like you said is is to talk about it because it, it does feel sometimes that this population is neglected in having conversations like the ones we're having now and 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 I think a, a big part of what could change it is um, educating yourself and and learning about these uh, you know what these people are afflicted with uh, like hearing your knowledge on it, I'm sure can open a lot of people's eyes uh, and, and learning from professionals and, and, and not taking so much from like, like you said, media, like a movies and stuff where they portray them in a very over the top, uh, you know, somewhat ridiculous ways at times. And uh, I think educating yourself is definitely a great way to help, you know, navigate around those sorts of biases that you may have about this population for sure. Yeah. And, and something that came to mind for me is, you know, and they are, at least when they're um, in our state like this, in an acute state, they are, they are trying to do anything that they can do to ask for help. Um, and that might be different than what um, other people might say to ask for help or might do to ask for help. And I think one of the most dangerous things is, um, like I said, not talking about it, which kind of reinforces, well, if I don't talk about it, then it's not really an issue, um, which is, doesn't do them justice, doesn't do this population justice. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Um, and then to go a little bit off of that, um, 
from your personal perspective in working at the hospital, uh, how is your working, like how has your work with the, uh, these clients changed since the pandemic has taken effect? And specifically with that, um, it's trying to find ways to be creative with um, working with them. And obviously we have, um, typically a, a, we are a shorter length of stay, we're a crisis stabilization unit, um, but wanna do what we can to get them stabilized, set them up for success and kind of addressing all the barriers that we um, talked about with this population in general kind of amplified right now. Um, the best that we're able to do is find creative ways to overcome those barriers. So if that's um, maybe you don't have an ID to get into the shelter, um, trying to give them as much paperwork and um, that we have here at the hospital to show the shelter system that this is, we verified who this person is um, to the best of our abilities to see maybe are they able to take someone and be flexible right now? Or maybe we have someone who, and then another one of the ones that came to mind was, um, let's say we don't have a place where we've been staying and I do get maybe a monthly check from social security disability. I think typically the, the majority of the individuals we work with of this population get about 780 a month to support everything. Um, I know we had one individual who, um, she didn't have a permanent residence for that check to be sent to, which is another barrier um, and was getting that check sent to a local business that she was close with. Um, during the pandemic, that business closed and she didn't have access to her check because that was getting mailed to somewhere that's not open for her to go get anymore. So maybe that's um, finding or, or even, even just asking these different resources that we have. Um, let's say this one group home, are you able to be flexible and take someone who is trying to find out how to get how to get her check. She does get a check and will be able to pay for the housing, but we need to get that check sent somewhere else, which is going to take time to process and um, try, just trying to be creative and it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, yeah, I, it doesn't hurt to ask and <laughs> kind of going off these like creative solutions that you've that you've found and, and, and then as we could try um, to kind of close this conversation, what are some ways that uh, we as a community can help up uplift this population and, and help them uh, with what they're going through, you know, especially now with the virus and effect and things like that? Mm -hmm. What are some ways like us as a whole community can help them? Yeah, and I think the biggest thing is have an open mind. Um, these This population is just, like I said, just individuals trying to navigate life in the best way that they can. And maybe that means on our end, so keeping an open mind and doing our best to support. Maybe we don't know someone ourselves who struggles with something like this. Maybe that means sharing this video so people can be exposed to something like this or maybe asking our neighbors or maybe we know someone down the street or an extended relative that might care for someone. Um, just asking, what what do you need? I know this is a difficult time right now. What what can I do to support you? And if that if the answer is no, I think we're we're doing really good right now. We have everything that we really need to support um, this family member. Um, that's still getting the the discussion out there um, and kind of reinforcing to, to that that family member or to that um, that individual that we're here for you. Um, we know that this is a, a, a challenging time and we just want to work together. Um, so keeping an open mind, reaching out to people, 
um, keeping the conversation going. Yeah, I, I think that's a great way to say, you know, the first steps to progress is always the talking about it. So uh, just to go off that, Stephen, thank you for taking the time to talk to me about this. Uh, and I'm glad that we were able to to discuss something that seems sometimes like it's a little bit taboo to speak about. Uh, so I'm, I'm so happy that we were able to get this out there and have people listen to this. Um, so uh, if anyone would like to check out all of our services, everything will be in the comment section below. Uh, all the information for the Central Florida Behavioral Hospital will also be in the comment section below. Um, but again, Stephen, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure talking to you. It definitely was. Thank you, Alan. And I'm, I'm thank you for reaching out and um, making this space to talk about something like this um, that is not something that's talked about far enough. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but again, Stephen, thank you. Uh, and thank you for joining us, uh, everyone. So have a great day, everybody. And have a great day, Stephen. Thank you.